From the Marquee Media Studio inside Mark Tank, it's the Mark Haney Show. Yes, this is the Mark Haney Show, and excited about what's happening here at the Growth Factory on our show and building the Backyard Vantage, which is this tribe of leaders in Sacramento that get it. They understand how entrepreneur can shape our future, future of our town, the future of our family, um, and our future. Today on the show, we're going to have Margo Folks share her story about helping those that grieve when they lose a loved one. And we don't think about that as much in business, but it, if we are working in a company or we own a company and we lose someone, figuring out how to deal with it appropriately can have a a world of complexity to it. And there's probably more than one right way to to deal with this and help lead through this. Margot is the she's the president of On Target Consulting, but she's also written a book, Leading Through Loss. So stick around. I think you're gonna enjoy hearing her thoughts and our conversation about just how I've had to deal with this a little bit. And she's obviously got a story that uh, has impacted her and that's why she's written the book. So stick around my friends, hear the story of Margo Folks. Okay, I'm here with Margo Folks. She is the president and founder of On Target Consulting Inc. But she's written this very interesting book on a topic that I think we all can relate to. The name of the book is Leading Through Loss and it's how to navigate grief at work. And for me, this is super interesting, but I have to imagine for everybody, we all either have lost somebody that we care about or we work with somebody that we care about. And I think the questions are like, how do we deal with it best? So maybe I can get just a little bit of your background. Margo, let's get to know each other, have our audience uh, get to know you a little bit, and, uh, and then we can dive into the into the topic. Okay, that sounds great. Um, thank you so much for having me today, Mark. I've been looking forward to our conversation. So I've been a consultant for more than 20 years. Um, I started my consulting practice after my son was born because I wanted the flexibility to be able to work, but also to be around for him and then for my daughter when she was born. Um, When my son was 13, um, Jimmy was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And as you can imagine, that upended my life, my husband's life, our daughter's life. And for the next eight years, he was in and out of treatment, mostly doing pretty well, actually. He graduated from high school. He went to college for two and a half years. But then when he was 21, he passed away from that brain tumor. Oh, boy. And I took, I had taken some time off to take care of him. And then on coming back from his celebration of life of life up in Portland, my mom took a turn for the worse. And a year later she died. And so I, it, you know, again, it upended my life completely. How long ago was this? So oh. Jimmy died in 2014 and my mom died in 2015, almost okay. a year later. Wow. Yeah, so I took a couple years more off to handle her estate and and deal with that. And then I as I when I was off, of course I was looking for resources to support me in my grief, things to read, websites, that kind of thing. And I couldn't really find what I was looking for. So I got this idea to create my own, my own blog, my own online community, which I ultimately named Saltwater. And when I went to the person who built the website, I was telling her about what I wanted and also that I was thinking about going back to work, but I wasn't sure. And she said, you need to do both. You need to launch both at the same time, which seemed overwhelming, but in hindsight was a really good idea because it kept me from being too immersed from the grief and loss side of things and and gave me that distraction. But you, that was a couple years later. Yes, I, I, I launched my con- at Saltwater and relaunched my consulting practice in 2018. So you did take a couple of years. I did. 
And what, if you don't mind me asking, what happened during the, that couple of years? That must, must have been devastating. It was. Um, it took about two years to deal with my mom's estate and just mm. all the mechano, you know, all the stuff that yeah. pa- our parents leave us yeah. you know, when they die. And then also some time to start writing and thinking about what I wanted to do, particularly with saltwater, but even with my business. You know, mm-hmm. what I what I felt like I could handle doing and what I felt like I couldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so the purpose behind doing this is to help others. Was there something that inspired you or prompted you to say, I want to share this information? I want I want to I want to help others with respect to the like what what made you want to help others when you're obviously grieving uh still i'm sure mm-hmm. and you're had you had the um generosity to help others when um i trying to put myself in that mm-hmm. position i'm going to want help <laughs> so right. and i and i'm helping others instead right. so exactly because what i discovered is that when when you're grieving you need people in different places in in your life with respect to grief so if you look at you know in my case i lost a child right so it was incredibly comforting to talk to people who were in exactly the same place i was in you know a year or 6 months however long it was from losing a child but it was also incredibly comfort- comforting to talk to someone who was five years out or 10 years out or 20 years out from losing a child. Because in those early months and years, I, I didn't know how I was going to survive. And I needed to talk to somebody who found a way to make a life in the aftermath of okay. that. Okay. And then as I moved down that continuum, I wanted to turn around and help people who were coming behind me. And because I had lost not just my son, but also my mother and my father had died a number of years ago, then it made me want to to branch out more broadly and not with the idea that I could help everyone because all of our experiences are different, but that I could bring together people who had lost different people that they cared about in their lives and help them make connections with other people who'd had a similar loss. You lost your son about eight years ago Mm -hmm. and your mom just after that and i've lost two parents and it's sad but i can't imagine losing a child my son was shot in afghanistan he lived others of his friends didn't come back so i've been around it and always you know it's a it's a word it's a parent's worst fear um and i've seen your posts on social media and you're still sharing about your son it's like it's like it's it's still very very fresh it's not your uh it's not just your work you're not you're living it even today eight years later right exactly exactly i i i I don't know that you ever stop living it it just it just evolves and even for the 20 year people that you've talked to there isn't a point where it's yeah, you rest easy with it? No, I don't think so. I mean, you rest easier. Okay. But it's always there. And and what you learn that nobody kind of tells you in advance is that there's always something that they are missing out on. So Jimmy would Jimmy turned 30 this year or should have turned 30. Mm-hmm. So he's at a phase where his friends are starting to get married and I'm and I'm expecting pretty soon they're going to start having children. Uh-huh. And so every time something like that happens as thrilled as I am for one of his friends, there's that little blow of he's not here to do that. He's not even here to be here for them as they do that. You know, to mm-hmm. be in the wedding, to hold the baby, all those things. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's talk about, okay, so maybe we'll break up the conversation however you want to, but I'm, I'm envisioning, envisioning the conversation kind of in a couple of parts. One, how do we help people deal with their grief? And two, as people that are in business, entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of our audience is entrepreneurs, but anybody who's in the workplace is having to help others deal with you know, help the community, help the culture of the company to right. deal with that loss when somebody uh, in the family, if you will, um, is hurting. Um, so maybe we can talk, let's start by, okay, somebody 
is dealing with this. Um, maybe it's a maybe it's a founder of a company you're trying to or uh, an employee, and they're um, you know they're going through that. Um, maybe we can kind of frame it from that person's perspective because we were just talking about you and um, two years off is a long time for someone to take off if they're an employee or a founder of a company. Oh, you were able to do it. Absolutely. Uh, thank, absolutely. thank goodness you were able to do it. You were a founder of a company and you still did it. <laughs> Thoughts on that? Oh, I think it's really hard to take time off. I mean, I was fortunate, you know, in that in that when you have a, you know, a dual working family, mm -hmm. then my husband also took a significant amount of time off, but then he went back to work before I did. So there, you know, we had that luxury to be able to do that. Most of the time, as you know, when particularly when you're an entrepreneur, it, it can be hard to take a couple of weeks off. Much, much less any more time than that. So for most folks, they have to go back to work. And I think one of the key things is, is, is helping other people around you help you. So if you need to work from home a bit more, if you need to maybe not have as many meetings, if you need to maybe be on the phone a bit less, whatever it is, it's about letting your team help you, but letting them know how to help you. Because it's just not a reality probably that you can take a, an indefinite time period off. I have to imagine, um, yeah, people that lose somebody while they're, why they have a job or why they're the CEO of a company, um, they don't know what to do, right? There's, uh, right. there up till now, I don't, there probably hasn't been a, 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 a game plan on the best way to, to cope with this. I remember Scott and I were just talking, my, my man here, Scott, we we're just talking about, about four or five years ago, we, we were doing, getting ready to do a show. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom, had been sick for a while. She'd had a brain aneurysm like 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so she just wasn't the same person for 20 or 30 years. And then it became, um, she got a lot worse and right before she died. And I was getting ready to do the show. And uh, it was like, I better go down and visit my mom before the show. And uh, while I was down there, I realized she was probably going to die that day. Wow. And mm. so then I had guests coming in. I think we had the president of Sutter coming in and somebody that owned a big marketing company. And I had never missed a show. Mm -hmm. I don't, I do, I do not miss, right? That's my mentality. Right. I don't know why it seems so silly now looking back as we're, Scott and I were kind of <laughs> laughing about it. How was I so shallow, right? That's <laughs> like, my mom's dying. She's probably going to die within the next few hours. And I'm more, I felt guilty letting my team down that I, and it was, it was, I think it was the overall stress of the moment. And I just sort of, you know, I called my, the guy that was helping me with the show then, Greg, and said, Greg, I don't think I'm going to be able to come back. And I just started getting choked up. And I was surprised that I was because it seems sometimes, I guess my point with this whole story about me is sometimes it seems so simple, but then it becomes, very, very difficult. And I don't think people knew how to support me other than Mark. It's okay. Right. right. Exactly. And, exactly. Uh, and it was okay. It wasn't, I didn't lose a child. And so it wasn't as difficult on me probably as even losing your mother because my mom had been sick for a long time. So, mm -hmm. um, but it was still hard. So anyway, I wonder about people. A lot of times, you know, we know about people that lose somebody and then how they help us, but um, anyway, I'm rambling because it, it hit me, but, uh, any thoughts on how people, cause maybe you don't, maybe I wasn't facing it is the, is the issue. Well, and also I think there's an underlying issue to it, which is there's no way to practice. There's no way to know how to, how to do this until you get in the moment. And so you may go into it thinking that you want to handle it one way and then the loss hits and you realize you need to handle it completely differently. So I don't know how people know, you know, like, for example, you take the assumption that people need time off after someone's lo lost a loved one. Right. Yet there's a number of people in the book who said what I discovered I needed most was I needed to be at work. And I and maybe I wanted to talk about my loss. Maybe I didn't want to talk about my loss, but I needed to be in the office. I could not stay home. Their way of dealing with it is just to stay busy. Exactly. Stay, keep, maybe maybe take their mind off it for the for the moment. 
Exactly. Um, and, and there's no way to anticipate that. I think that's the really hard thing is humans, we like to be in control and we like to anticipate what we're going to need in a given situation. And that's one of the things that is so hard and scary about loss is we don't know how we're going to be. And we may find that we are completely different than we how we expected to be when we lose someone. Did anything surprise you in the loss of either your mom or your son How about you? One of the biggest surprises for me, because I tend to think of myself as a realist, was that in the early weeks and months after Jimmy died, I had a hard time accepting the reality of it. And that he, you know, he, he came home from school, from college for the last year of his life. And he died in, in our house, you know, in our home, in the guest room. So I'd watched him decline. I was, you know, there for every minute. I watched him die. I was in the room. And yet I would sit in the kitchen at the counter doing some paperwork or something and feel as though he were upstairs or away at school. And it was the strangest feeling. And I was so grateful that I read Joan Didion's book called The Year of Magical Thinking because she writes about how she left her husband's shoes by the door because she really believed he was going to come back. And she knew, you know, that he had died. He had died in front of her. He'd had a heart attack at the dinner table. But yet some part of her was still expecting him to walk through the door. Hmm. And if you'd asked me in advance... I would have said, well, no, of course not. I watched him die. I mean, I'm not going to be like that. And yet I had the strongest feeling that he was he was somewhere, just not in the room. And that feeling, did you did you think it was like his spirit or was it uh, or it is his spirit or is it um just something your your mind playing tricks thinking he's gonna actually walk through the door oh i think it's more that the oh. feeling of like he was just gonna come down the stairs or walk in the okay. door that kind of thing and again i knew that that wasn't possible but yet i did have this very strange feeling like well maybe oh interesting yeah, yeah. and i would never have predicted that in advance yeah uh any thoughts then in terms of people um that are they're an entrepreneur. They're a founder. They've lost somebody uh, close to them. And um, so you, you said that it's going to be unpredictable how, how you're going to feel, mm -hmm. how we would feel. Um, any best practices that maybe it would be helpful to at least uh, have in the back of our mind going <laughs> in? Because there are people out there that have uh, loved ones that have terminal illnesses. Right. And so you... We, we know it's coming, um, mm -hmm. you know, the likelihood of it coming is very, very good. Um, and so we, we do need to prep ourselves a bit. Right, exactly. Well, I, you know, using you as an example, right, and what happened with you, I think it's twofold. One is to just stay open to how you might be feeling and, and try not to judge yourself. You know, so like when you said you didn't think that you could do the podcast, then to think, okay, that's okay. Like I'm, yeah. I'm allowed to do like, that's all right. Forgive I'm, I'm, yourself. <laughs> forgive yourself. Right. As yeah. opposed to like Ann Head, who is now the CEO of Head Cycling said when her husband died, she said, I just powered through. Mm -hmm. And looking back, she said, I wish I had known that maybe that wasn't necessarily the best approach was to just to power through that I should have offered myself and my employees a bit of grace and some space to really mourn the death of her husband, who was the CEO at the time. So I think that's part of it. And then I think it's just it's staying very flexible because it you feel one way at the outset and then it can change. And so there you can't really fully settle in in those early weeks and months because you may feel like you you know want to be back at work but you don't want to talk about it and then two or three months in you may realize you know what i really want to talk about my mom or my son and so it's not getting kind of set on this is how it's going to be it's going to change one of the things so last night um ironically in terms of timing of this last night yesterday was my mom's birthday and my brother from out of town, he flew in, my sister, we all went to this restaurant that we go to every year on my mom's birthday. And we actually planted a tree out at our property 
uh, in memory of my mom. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and yesterday was her birthday. And um, I bring this up because it surprised me how I would feel about the people that were there for me, how I feel today about the way people that were there for me at that that day, how that would impact me. So my daughter and my wife, so I, I mentioned I didn't do the podcast that mm-hmm. day. Okay, right. I left myself off the hook, didn't do the podcast. So the guy that I called and he let me off the hook, Greg, it's like, I'll never forget that. And then the other thing that I won't forget, and this is why we went back to the same restaurant every year is, uh, and I'm surprised how much this hit me, um, but my mom, I think, died about two o'clock. And I think it was probably about one o'clock. And it doesn't look like she's going to die, right? She's just a fighter. She's been like, <laughs> it's like, my mom won't die. And uh, so, okay, I'm getting hungry. So I, my daughter and I, and she's an adult, my adult daughter and I, and, uh, uh, and my wife go over to this little restaurant that's by, she died in like an old folks home type thing. And uh, we go over there and we're eating lunch. And so my brother's staying with my mom and then, mm-hmm. you know, ah, we can go grab something to eat real quick. This is not going anywhere. And uh, so we go home, we over to the restaurant and right in the middle of, um, uh, right in the middle of lunch, I get the call and my mom, you know, Mom, your mom died mm-hmm. and uh her mom died and uh so we all leave and uh we're in a hurry uh and i don't know why we're in such a hurry but we had to get out of there real fast right. sure and uh you know five minute drive and we got out of there really quick and we didn't pay the bill and uh the guy's like don't pay get out of here you know i kind of i think one of us told him what happened got out of there and we went back that night uh at the end of the night you said you know, debrief or whatever that uh, time and we had dinner and they wouldn't let us pay for dinner. So they didn't let us pay for lunch. Yeah. And didn't let us pay for dinner. And I'm like, you know, those people that are there. Right. Exactly. It's so silly. I mean, it, it was very nice. The name of the restaurant's Primo's in Rockland, but it's just a pizza place. It's, it's good. I mean, it's got good pizza, but uh, it was that people do something simple for you right at that time it's like gosh you know stays with you i i have to imagine those kind of things are like every in every story that you talk to talk to people about it's like everybody has those people and so that makes me think about oh wow there really is a an opportunity or maybe I hate to be think opportunistically but there is a best way to handle things if you know somebody's going through those kind of moments. Exactly. Oh, I think that's so true. And it's, and it is so often the littlest things that really stay with people and that provide the most support. Did you have that with your, um, with your son, Jimmy? I mean, is what that day or that, is that a fog or is that a, that, that moment when you lost Jimmy. Is that more of a fog, or were there certain people that 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 person really was impactful? Yeah, the, I think of when I think of him dying. What I remember most was that the hospice nurse and the social worker who had been assigned to him by Sutter um, they they came over about eight thirty that night because we knew at that point that he was dying, and they stayed until he died. And then they were the ones who dressed him because Dan and I just said, we, we can't do this. It's too, it's too hard. And so they were there all the way through until the funeral home came and picked him up. And that wasn't because Sutter said, you know, this is part of your job, go do this thing. But over the four months or so that they had been coming to the house and spending time with him and with our family, they both just said to us, you know, when the time comes, we will be here. It doesn't matter what time, it doesn't matter how late we will be here with you. And one of the beautiful things that came out of that was Alicia, the nurse, when she came, was wearing sandals. Now, normally, of course, you know, she was coming in scrubs. She was wearing, you know, some kind of covered shoe. But because she came in sandals that night, my husband looked down and saw that she had the tattoo of a footprint 
on the top of one of her feet. Hmm. And he asked about it and she said, oh, that's my daughter's footprint. When she was born, I got that, you know, oh, for wow. my daughter Haley. And so Dan said he looked at it that night and thought, that's what I'm going to do after Jimmy dies. And so my husband has on his on each of his feet, he has each of Jimmy's feet from his, you know, his birth. It's not the birth certificate, but it's whatever that yes. certificate you get from the hospital, uh -huh. you know, where they do the imprint. And then he's got Jimmy's initials on one side and Jimmy's date of birth oh my God. on the other. And it's, you know, it's, it's something it's tattooed to his tattooed feet? to the top of his feet. He said it was the most painful thing he's ever been through. Oh, I can imagine. Well, I've never had a tattoo, but it sounds painful. Yeah. The tops of your feet are uh, sensitive. Yes. Yes. But he said. But they're like, yeah. So they're probably like a couple inches uh, big. Yeah. Yeah. Probably like that. Maybe the footprints are about that big. Okay. And then like in a little, a little arc over each is the date And of if birth. you're watching, not watching this on YouTube, you're here on podcast. It's, she's like. You know, picture a little baby's foot. Yeah, right yeah. on the top of his feet. Exactly. So that was spawned, obviously, from uh, your hospice workers. Um, right, the, from her showing moment. up. Yeah, and that not because up. that's what, you know, in her mind, that's not why she was there, of course. But it, but those tattoos, Dan would say, have given him incredible comfort because he hmm. looks down and he carries Jimmy with him everywhere wow. he goes. And it never probably would have occurred to him to get those had wow. he not seen. A, I can almost a, picture Jimmy walking on your husband's feet. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Right. Because I mean, as yeah. a dad, right? Yeah, I mean, moms like, too, but particularly to dads. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah. you do. You put them on your feet yeah, or wow. even just the kids love that idea of standing yeah. on your feet. So. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Are yeah. they facing the same way as his feet? Or are they facing opposite? They, yeah. They, yeah. So they face yeah. along with his yeah. feet. Oh, wow. Exactly. That's interesting. Exactly. Um, okay. So one of the things that I know that you did, um, you know, I was kind of talking about what, what do you do? That's an interesting, I mean, that's extremely creative, um, which I love, but that way you, you think about it always and probably makes him want to go around and barefooted a lot. Um, so he can see it, um, see them. But you reached, I didn't know that you knew my wife. My wife has been checking my calendar. We have, I have a shared calendar and obviously she's looking at my stuff, which <laughs> she saw your name on the, uh, she saw your name on the calendar. You doing a podcast with Margot folks? And I'm like, yeah, why? What's up? And she's like, I know her. What? Yeah. You, did you used to do fitness with her? Or something Kaya. Yeah, Kaya we used fitness? To do Kaya okay. That's together, what I was yeah. thinking she said. Mm -hmm. But the thing that stood out to me that she said is after she had lost her sister, I think it was her sister. She lost her, her dad not that long ago this year. And mm -hmm. then her sister a couple years ago, right? Just before COVID or at the beginning stages of COVID. Um, and she said, you reached out to her I and did. like that, like, boom, that was, I mean, I think maybe when people reach out to you, Unexpectedly, I mean, someone from the workout place right. is uh, reaching out. You may, I mean, obviously, boom, she really, you know, yeah. she has a feeling for you because of that, that more than some lady I used to work out with. Right, <laughs> exactly. I do, I really try to always, when I when I see, you know, even social media is, is oftentimes how we find out. I mean, in this case, we were, this was pre-COVID, so Stacy and I were, were still involved with Kaya, oh, you were. Okay, or remember. it's possible that she had stopped, but we were connected on social media. Mm -hmm. So I felt a kinship and wanted to, you know, wanted to reach out to her. But you know, so often that's that's what when somebody says, "Well, what's what's the most important thing to do?" It's reaching out because we assume that people do but so often nowadays what reaching out looks like is you know you post on social media gosh i'm really sad my mom just passed away and people will like the post or heart the post and say gosh i'm so sorry my heart's with you and and again i'm not knocking that because that's mm -hmm. that is support too but then they don't often take that next step, which is to send a card or or a note or a text, but to reach out directly. And I just know when Jimmy died, that that meant everything when people would do that. And and there's it's it's not bad to do it on social media, but in my opinion, if you have a relationship with the person, it's not quite enough. To you know, just it's interesting do it. because I think shy people, um, I 
It's funny, uh, having a podcast, this guy is not a shy, introverted person. <laughs> he would be super outgoing and gregarious. So really, I don't think I'm, I'm not that way. I'm really probably more reserved is in his mind and maybe self-conscious about being too forward with people. Um, and so I'm the type of person that doesn't do as much of that as what I probably ought to or what I, what I definitely ought to. Um, and so I kind of wonder about that. So for someone like me, who's a little gun shy about all that stuff anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, being overly close, you know, being one of those people that's overly close and, you know, trying to jump on the bandwagon when I never talk to this person, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about how I'm going to be perceived at mm -hmm. some level. It's like, look, I just, I want to do whatever's help, most helpful. Right. Um, I think it's really how I feel about that. Um, but without looking like I'm trying too hard and, you know, people giving them like wanting to push me away a little right. bit because of that. Um, so with that said, it's easy to like on Facebook or it something. Is. If that's easy, it's almost harmless. Uh, maybe even make a comment. Okay. Um, but I didn't know your sister. I didn't know your son. I know you as an acquaintance for me. Maybe I know you as an acquaintance mm -hmm. from coming on the show or maybe a, from CrossFit or something like that. I, you know, it's not like I've ever texted you before type right. thing. Those kind of relationships, it's like, what do you, what do you do? And like, though that's kind of an interesting question. I, I say that for, I think there's a decent percentage of the population that's probably a little bit more like me. Oh, that a, is a more large like, percentage. Okay, mm -hmm. because we care deep down but just don't want to be uh, perceived wrong. Uh, I don't want to be in the way, you know? Yeah, well, so part of it's about, you know, you don't want to do something that's invasive. Like, yeah. you know, if you don't know the person well, then you don't want to pick up the phone and call, right? Because that is probably, you're probably not the person they want to hear from in that moment. But that's why I do love cards. I mean, I have okay. all the cards that were sent to me after my mom died, after Jimmy died, after my dad died, because there is something about being able to hold that and 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 know that you you know that you can reread them or even just just the physicality of having them. So I don't think those feel invasive to people ever. And and one of the miscalculations I think that people, well-meaning people do not knowing, is they assume that the person is going to get a flood of support. And what I've learned over the years, much to my sadness from working with people through saltwater, is that it is shocking how many people don't show up for other people in their lives. And I, it would never have occurred to me because people were so wonderful about showing up for us, even people that we didn't know well. And I think some of that is when you lose a child or you have a child who has brain cancer, people will lean in in a way that they might not when it's a parent and a little bit more kind of circle of life, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But there's so many people that I've talked to where everything kind of went silent after they lost even a yeah. child. And so I always figure if I have a, at least some connection with the person, then I just say something very brief, like I'm so terribly sorry. You know, I don't know that we're ever ready to lose our parents and, you know, our mom, our dad, and, you know, again, my heart is with you. And you don't have to say a lot, but it yeah. probably would surprise you how many people might well circle back and say, you know, Mark, your card came the very day I most needed some words of support. Yeah. Interesting that you say that. I think about the other thing, uh, God, they're making this so much about me. This is awkward, but I feel like it's, I, I feel like I, maybe I'm, uh, I relate, my, my scenario might relate to other people. Absolutely. So that's why I sort of Absolutely. bring my, one of the reasons I bring myself into it. So as a guy, um, I post on social media cause I've got, uh, you know, a show and stuff like, that. otherwise I probably wouldn't do a lot of posting on social media if I wasn't, you know, if this wasn't my occupation, right. I probably wouldn't. And so you think, and I think generally maybe I'm stereotyping a little bit here, you know, guys aren't going to post their, uh, their sadness on, um, 
Now, I didn't post anything about losing my mom on, uh, yeah. uh, you know, on social media. And my, and I think even my family didn't even know what to say. So they probably didn't post anything either. So there was very little said about my mom dying. Uh, my brothers and sisters are highly private and I don't even think they mess around with social media. I don't even think really that many people knew my mom died, which is kind of interesting that, you know, and, and so people didn't know to reach out. Um, and so you, those people, there's a lot of people like that where there's right. like, oh, nobody even knows that person's going through something and all your old buddies would probably love to, you know, say something to you, but they don't even know about it. It's kind of right. an interesting challenge. And I, you know, I'm not saying poor me, I'm just saying it's hard to, it's hard to like understand that opportunity when it doesn't um, present itself. Right, exactly. Exactly. Well, and then, you know, when you think about the workplace, that's what makes grief support so tricky is we're all so different. Right. And so what you might need coming back to work could be very different, say, than what I would need if I were coming back to work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I talk about in the book is it's it it's why I think having a point person can be really helpful because you know, if someone, for example, is getting too much attention and they, they feel like, I don't want to talk about my loss. Like, I appreciate that people are acknowledging it, but I can't, I can't carry this right now. It's too much. It's really lovely to be able to say to a trusted colleague or your boss, you know, could you let people know how much I appreciate this, but I really, I, I can't talk about it right now. Mm -hmm. And to ask someone else to help you with that. And, and it can go both ways, right? So like when my son died, I had a friend call the woman who does my hair and say, you know, Margo's coming in in two weeks because she needs a haircut. She does not want to talk about her son. So please don't bring it up. Mm -hmm. And then that way I didn't have to say it, nor did I have to have an awkward conversation that I didn't want to have, right? Mm -hmm. But conversely, if somebody isn't getting enough support, it can also be nice to have either a friend or a colleague say, you know, I think we need to we need to acknowledge this a bit more. You know, Mark would really like to talk about his mom a bit at work in a sort of natural way or whatever was working best for you and, and to give other people guidance because we really don't know. And we tend to err on the side of not saying anything, which is not always the best choice, depending on the person. Yeah. So then I'm going to maybe paraphrase if, if it's OK, is if sure. you are um, if you're a, a teammate out there or a friend out there and you know somebody that's either about to be going through the grieving process or, or at the beginning stages of that, maybe uh, volunteer. Is that the best way yeah. for it to go? Somebody who's good with people and understanding of the situation, maybe just go, hey, if you need me to run point for you, right. um, I'm open to that. Is that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's so helpful, both in our personal lives and also in our professional lives. Yeah. And sometimes it's also about backing somebody down because there's also stories about, you know, coworkers who with all good intentions probably are are in someone's office too often. Or one person talked about there was a colleague they didn't actually like and the person kept showing up and saying, you know, Mark, are you OK? I really want to take you for coffee. Do you want to go for a walk? Mm -hmm. Can we talk? And it wasn't even that the the grieving work, you know, person didn't want support. They didn't want support from that person. <laughs> Yeah. because they were not one of their favorites. And so if you have a point person, that person can go to that that person and say, look, Joe, you know, Mark so appreciates your support, but he really needs space right Scott, now. Scott, you're my point person if I ever into that, okay? Uh, <laughs> because, you know, you want somebody who can who can handle it without right. hurting feelings. Exactly. Right? Because exactly. you, know, you don't want to, even if, just because so-and-so is not my favorite person, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Right. I mean, right. Well, and you're not in the best state to handle it, yeah. right? You're more likely to get upset. And if Joe gets his feelings hurt and then snaps at you, you're emotional. You're more likely to get mad at him, right? Whereas this neutral third party can just very gently say, may not make it about the other person and just kind mm -hmm. of ask, you know, for a little bit of space for you. Yeah. I have to imagine people that are like best friend, like if it's outside the workplace, people that fall into that best friend category or brother or sister mm -hmm. type thing, they fill that role probably 
better. They kind of know the circle right. of friends. And, and, and they're like more that. likely yeah. to do it more seamlessly, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to say, could you run point for me? They just kind yeah. of step in and, and know that like the nosy neighbor or the, the friend who's a little too invasive, they just know instinctively to kind of back them off or say something. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go. I've, I've very, I said I'm gonna use the chapters of the book as our outline. Okay, so okay, you've got a bunch of business stuff in here. I I have uh, sidetracked from that a little bit. So that's fine. Um, so the first couple of chapters are around kind of like the impact on a business, um, and you know the the cost of grief in the workplace and understanding the impact. Um, that's kind of the problem that we. I guess if I'm the CEO of a company, um, I know this is happening within my, you know, somebody's uh, grieving with one of my teammates is grieving. This is going to, this is going to impact the organization, uh, right. maybe in a big way. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe some thoughts on that a little bit. You've already touched on that a bit, but maybe uh, share with us kind of you know, other best practices to, to be thinking about. Cause you know, an entrepreneur, as you mentioned before the show, um, it's pretty impactful if somebody was to take two years off, you know, uh, yeah, or or even uh, you know a month. Even a, a, you know a, a a key employee needs to take a month off, and the business is tenuous as it is. Exactly, exactly. Well, and and I think so much of the conversation in the public forum about grief in the workplace tends to center around bereavement leave, and because most companies, on average, give three days. Which if you can imagine after your child dies, your spouse dies, your mother what? dies. Three days? Three days. That's the national, yeah. three to four days then is you, the national you're average. Using, uh, and non-bereavement leave, so I don't understand the, all that. So mm-hmm. I'm sure each company has their own policy, but there's a regulation, it sounds like, that you have to give somebody three days off. Mm-mm. No. No. What's this three days thing? It's, not it's a, just an average. Oh, so it's that's an average. what most, okay. yeah, that's what most companies give offer. Three days, and that's paid mm-hmm. in most companies, yes. that type of thing. Okay. Exactly. So, but as um, you can imagine, if you're planning a service or celebration of life, if you know you're dealing with, you know, the funeral home, you're dealing with death certificates, uh, you know, accounts, if it's a spouse mm-hmm. or a parent, right? It, it's nowhere near enough time. So So the focus has been to say, quite rightfully, people need more time, you know, and there's an argument for giving two weeks, a month, whatever, which, as you point out, if you're running a small company and you're an entrepreneur, on the one hand, yes, you know, from a heart perspective, of course you want to give someone two weeks or a month off, but that can be very challenging to do. Um, and so also people who are grieving will tell you, I don't necessarily want a month off. I mean, some people do, but some people might only want a week and then the ability to take the odd afternoon or the day off here and there as they need to deal with something or they just need a day out of the office. So I think sometimes when people think about the cost of supporting someone who's grieving, they go straight to bereavement leave. But so often that's not what's most needed necessarily. It, it's really more, it's it's interesting because Truck Stoll, who I interviewed for the book, whose son Gage died, he was one of Jimmy's inspirations, and he died at the age of nine of cancer. Oh, boy. And only child. So, you know, you can imagine Trux and Lauren were absolutely devastated. And Trux was able to take three months off from work because his coworkers donated time off that they had saved PTO and he had some amount of time the company gave him and they went around the world with Gage's ashes to all the places that their boy wanted to go and never was was able to go and Chuck said it was you know it was an amazing opportunity not opportunity that's the wrong word but it, it it was a gift to be able to go and do this but he said what didn't change was that when we got back I had to go back to work and, and if you talk to anyone, no matter how much time they've had off, they'll follow it with, but eventually I had to go back to work. And that's why sometimes I think we miss the point when we focus so exclusively on bereavement leave, because the real support starts when the person has to come back to work. And so there's an argument for three days isn't enough, but the fix is not necessarily just to say, great, Mark, I'm giving you a month. Now you're all set. You're supported. Yeah. There, there's more to do. As it's far as that goes, yeah, we need it's certain cases. You need that time to escape, I guess, and mm-hmm, just kind of get your head together. And then, but facing reality, the reality that life goes on, and you have to continue to help yourself be happy, find a way to be happy. 
Um, it makes me think about policies, though, as I sit there and put my CEO hat on mm-hmm. or HR director hat on. Um, is that typically what you see is people have a bereavement policy? Hey, you get three days off or, uh, you know, is it is it recommended that you give, uh, they put it all in writing to, to avoid... Uh, you know, I guess not treating people equally. Yes. I think, I think there's a real argument for having a bereavement policy, but I think sometimes we can be too prescriptive. So I, in the book, in one of the appendices, I share a sample bereavement policy that came from a, from a nonprofit in, in England, actually. And what I love about it is that there's this openness to it where they don't say, if you lost someone in these categories, then you get these numbers of days off. It's simply if you lost someone you love, then you are entitled to X number of days off. And then you can also talk to your manager about negotiating more time and also how you take that time so that you don't have to take it all in one chunk. Mm -hmm. You can say they basically, as I remember, they allow you a full year so that you might take some days up front for sure, but then you might you might need days you know further along as as time passes. And what I love about that is the flexibility because like I think of my own situation, I have a cousin on my dad's side who is like my sister, and we are incredibly close, and I'm going to feel her loss tremendously. But if I were working in a company and went in and said, "My cousin died, and I'm devastated." People think, oh, well, cousin, right? Right. She's not your sister, you know? Or And so I, that's, I'm not a huge fan sometimes of, of labels on the family tree always telling you the whole story, right? Because sometimes we are closer to a best friend than we are to a sibling. Yeah. So I like, I like a bit of openness in a bereavement policy so that there's room for for people to be able to be, you know, to treat employees like adults and let them tell us how much the person means instead of making it prescriptive. That's interesting because as we're, my mind's calculating on, you know, what I would do, I I do have a company, I don't even know what our policy is, but I should. (laughs) Uh, But, uh, uh, you know, I was just thinking back, my uh, my father-in-law died uh, earlier this year and I needed to be there for the day of the funeral f- to support my wife and the family. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's an all day thing. And, um, but I didn't need all that extra time. Uh, even though he's my father-in-law, my wife didn't require that I, you know, be there with her. Uh, you know, that wasn't what she necessarily needed and it wasn't what I needed just based upon our relationship. Um, but there are people out there that might milk a situation like that and take the full three days or take the week or whatever. And I, I keep thinking to myself, there's other kinds of, um, you know, people use their uh, paid time off and their sick time and all these kind of things. And I always think back to kind of a belief that as entrepreneurs, um, as business owners, business leaders, let's build the kind of companies that people don't want to milk it, right? Don't want to yes. go out there, build a great enough uh, opportunity that um, that people aren't abusing leave policies and then have the flexibility to let the people grieve for a month or whatever they need right. when it's de- when it's absolutely devastated somebody the company's great enough you know you're gonna you're gonna win on the you know on the on the short end of things where people are taking a day off like like I did um, and yet you you know you you support your best people you support any human being and give them the time off they need to to grieve. Exactly. Well, and the thought that I have on that is, you know, that's, as you well know, that's why hiring is so important, right? So when someone says to me, oh, but they might take advantage, my first thought is, well, what kind of culture are you building, yeah. right? Who are you hiring? Because when you hire people that are deeply loyal to your organization and want to do their best work, and you hire the right people and put them in the right roles, then they're only going to take what time they really need. They're not going to milk it. They're not going to take it just because it's there. They're going to take care of themselves and know that that's what's ultimately best for the company because it will allow them to come back and and show up in the way that that they know their team and their leader wants them to. And sadly, I think think this uh, this is why I love entrepreneurship is because 
typically in entrepreneurial type companies, that's what you have. You have people that are all um, almost like in a small company with five, 10 employees, okay. even 20. It could even be 100. Um, the people feel ownership in that company or maybe they even have stock options or you know they have uh, bonuses associated with how well the company does and so on. You know, they, they have a, they've got skin in the game. Right. Um, I think so many times in these larger organizations that run very bureaucratic and feel, people feel a little more like a number, um, hey, you might as well take it. Everybody else is doing it, right? There ends up being that culture. And you don't have that entrepreneurship for most, you know, most right. of the time. Uh, we don't see it as often, at least not the companies I'm I'm around. Yeah, no, uh, I think I think that's really true. And also that's the point, too, about, you know, to circle back about why grief support is so much more than just, you know, bereavement leave. It's it's about the person you work for, whether it's the entrepreneur or, you know, one of the senior leaders that works for the entrepreneur. Right. It's the support you get from that person mm -hmm. that means more than how many days off you get. Yeah. As long as you get some. I mean, you, you need some time off. A hundred percent. So uh, when an employee dies, and I was also sharing with Scott, I've, I don't think we, we've been working together for a lot of years. We've never had an employee die. Definitely never had one die at work. Mm -hmm. um, I did on my dad's company. We, I, I, I was folding my newspapers and got the knock on the door. I was folding the newspapers uh, when I was about nine or 10 years old. And the guy knocked on the door and, and the police officer and told my dad that somebody had died. Uh, one of his employees had died at his TV shop the night before in a car wreck. And I, the family was devastated. And I, I do remember that, but you know, I've owned my own business a long time and I've never had, other than that one time when I was like yeah. 10, I've never really been involved with that. I know in law enforcement and my son being in the military, they, right. you see that more often, but, um, how, I mean, how common is it for an employee to die? Oh, I couldn't give you a statistic on that. I would say a lot more common now with COVID. Yeah. Oh, you okay. know, if you think back, I mean, not this moment, but you think back to when, you know, those, those 2020, 2021 yeah. there, I think it was, it went way up. And I guess if you have employees time. too, that are um, working near their retirement age, 60 years old, 70 sure. years old, and they're, they're still, you know, cranking along. Exactly. A lot more likely to go. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and just, you know, anytime you, you know, you read in the paper that someone's died in a car accident or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing too, right? If they're within working age, they may well, they have a job somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as common, but it's, but it still happens. Yeah. Okay. So dealing with that when an employee dies, um, obviously you got a chapter in your book. What right. Right. So I think it's sort of twofold, right? It's for the for the leader, it's reaching out to the employee's family and, you know, paying respects, offering to come to the celebration of life or the memorial service mm -hmm. and, you know, seeing if that's OK. The family may not be doing something where they want the, the work team, you know, to come, but making that offer, allowing employees to go. You know, not making, you know, saying mm. you can't have the after afternoon off to go attend, you know, Sue's funeral, et cetera. So it's being supportive in that way of yeah. the family. And that's got to be tough if you got a restaurant or something where you're oh, face absolutely. to face with the public. Yeah. And Maybe you, know, you have to shut the company down to, which, hey, potentially. Maybe it's worth it to shut the company down for a day if one of the servers dies. Sure. Absolutely. And again, it's, you know, it's all based on the circumstance. It may not be possible, in which case maybe you go and a couple people who don't have shifts, you know, it, it's not like you have to tie yourself into a pretzel, but you want to show up for the family of, of this person who's worked for you. Um, and that can also mean, you know, encouraging people to send a note because stories are really beautiful, right? So if, if you've worked with the person who's died, sending a note to the family saying, you know, I, I love the fact that every time I saw Mark, he had a huge smile on his face and we're going to miss that so much around the office. That means so much to the family, you know, and particularly if you have a funny story or a sweet story that they might never have heard about something that person did around the office, you know, that has, that has tremendous valuable value to the family to hear that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, as you as you know, particularly in smaller companies with entrepreneurs, when you lose someone, you really do feel like you've lost someone in the family. And I think sometimes one of the mistakes that gets made is 
the the person dies and there's this acknowledgement you know they the leader tells the team the ceo tells the team and you know there's a moment of silence and, and a bit of discussion and then it's okay well how are we going to get the work covered and yes you have to worry about that but at the same time you have to make sure that people have time to talk about this and process it. And I'm not talking about huge chunks of time, but there's, you know, there's a bit of checking in to make sure people are doing okay. Maybe scheduling a meeting where people can come for just, you know, an hour or so and tell stories about the person who's been lost and really honor them within the context of work and not kind of sweeping past it so fast that people don't have a chance to really process and mourn their co their coworker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think about even the role of certain occupations too. As you were talking about this, I, I thought back. So some one of the things that I do, obviously I have a podcast and so I share stories of entrepreneurship. Um, this one's a little bit unique uh, in terms of the topic. Um, but I'm also, uh, we have a charitable organization called Allegiant Giving where we help veterans and we have a veteran right. community um and so the two things i i've been thinking about the best way to approach um now that this topic is sort of surfaced um number one is when somebody in entrepreneurship an iconic entrepreneur of sacramento mm -hmm. dies occasionally you'll be driving down the uh, the freeway and see a billboard right. of Randy Paragary died. You know, he's a famous restaurant yeah. in town, um, just an iconic uh, entrepreneur. I didn't happen to know him, but I saw him on, I think it was the Marquee Media Billboard, which is one of our sponsors, or our, our, our key sponsor. And I was like, go Marquee for um, taking a role as a media person and saying, look, we're going to do a, a little bit of a tribute here to um, somebody uh that passed away that's made a big impact on our region and i really never thought about that as a role of me as a podcaster radio guy mm -hmm. um but with my focus beyond sacramento entrepreneurship it kind of prompts me to think that that might be helpful to our community for me to be thinking that way um and on the veteran side i actually i've wrestled with this one a little bit because we've lost so I have this is veteran organization. I have events and I, I say I, it's a, it's a community that we right. built around veterans and veterans, people die in the military. Right. We've Absolutely. recently lost one of the people that died recently went to my high school and they were, you know, the, I think they were the last the little girl, woman was the last woman to get killed in Afghanistan. Oh. We were sh kind of shooting our way out of there as we backed our way out of Afghanistan. Um, she happened to be someone that went to my high school, uh, you know, obviously 30 plus years younger, um, just a, a, a very young person. It's like how to keep people want to keep that memory alive, which is what I, one of the things I've heard a few times is people want to keep their loved one's memory right. alive. Another person that I have reached and I didn't really reach out to that first one, even though I probably should. It's my. I don't know, maybe it's laziness um, and maybe now time decay. That was like a year ago. Um, but more recently, a Marine Corps person, acquaintance's child, somebody in the real estate community, which I'm also involved in real estate, mm -hmm. um, uh, lost her son um, in a, just a training accident. And I'm like, oh man, I want to help keep the memory alive if I can. Mm -hmm. And just making sure that leaders think that way i think that way but what to do right. when you are in a special position to to help in that way versus personal uh love and attention um helping keep the memory alive because you're in a position of influence or or you know you've got a microphone right exactly well and what i think of too mark is when you're thinking about a company right and someone someone dies to what I think of is that the wisdom is in the company. The wisdom is in the room. So if you call your team together and say, how shall we honor this person mm -hmm. that we've lost from our work family? People will tell you, 
right? And it might be that they want to put up kind of a billboard of memories of, not a billboard, I'm sorry, like a a bulletin board, right? Mm -hmm. We post photos and stories and things like that. They might want to gather once a year in honor of that person, you know, kind of like you were talking about going to that restaurant. They might want to, you know, Mm -hmm. have some kind of gathering. Sometimes people want to do something charitable. You know, let's organize a run or some kind of an event and raise money for a, a cause that was near and dear to the employee who died. But I think it's it's also about involving the other people and not feeling like you as entrepreneur, or as leader, has to have all the answers, but let it bubble up from the people who also worked with that person as to how they want to remember them. Yeah. One of the companies as an investor, I'm wearing all these hats, investor. Right. Uh, the other one I have is an investor. Maybe... <laughs> Maybe this is ADD. I think I am doing too many things. So I'm invested into a lot of companies. One of them uh, is relates to this topic. Um, and John Shumate, he actually came on our show and he's building a company called Remember.us. I think he might be changing the story, the name of the company to LifeStory.us. Uh, anyway, it's basically a website for remembering uh, a loved one. Right. And it could be a, somebody who's still alive but it's it's a it's basically like a community page that's private mm-hmm. versus Facebook where right. everybody's chiming in from yeah. all over. Um, you can create a private page that allows you to share memories and videos and stories and even on their birthdays and you know people can mm-hmm. kind of keep the memory alive. Um, I feel like it, it really is a. a, a a needed thing to do. It's very therapeutic for all of us to be remembering my mom or remembering um, your son or a, a coworker that may have passed away. It's therapeutic for all of us. Oh, exactly. Well, and also too, you know, some of the folks I talked to said, you know, that they did something like that, not necessarily online. It might be more, you know, hard copy kind of thing, mm-hmm. but then they give it to the family. So then there's also this opportunity again for the family to get insight into how well loved and appreciated this their loved one was at work where they might not have any idea about a lot of those relationships and how much that person contributed yeah um so uh maybe we can kind of take the last couple minutes and kind of wrap i know there's areas probably that we did not go where did we not go with the discussion that we probably should have? And then I also want to give you a chance to have closing thoughts too of um, just for for all of us and how we deal with these, uh, sometimes they're tragedies and many times they're, um, they're sad, but how we deal with this grief. Yeah. So I, the, the thing that calls out to me is, is this new world that we're all in now of hybrid and remote work because just as it makes it more complicated if we are say you know like for you if you're meeting with 15 or 20 entrepreneurs it's not the same meeting on zoom as it is in person you can get a lot done but there's a level of interaction and connection that happens when you're in the same room and you're really feeding off of each other's energy or you can tell that somebody's really struggling or feeling like they're not getting their question answered where you might not notice it if you have a sea of faces, for example, right? So grief support gets a lot more complicated in some ways, or I shouldn't say complicated, it gets more challenging when you're talking about hybrid or remote work environments because you are just a face in a sea of faces at a team meeting, for example. Whereas if we're in the same room, I can tell from body language, if you're kind of hunched down in the chair, you're a little bit withdrawn, you know, that kind of thing. I can pick up some some cues that you might be having a really hard time and I might miss it completely on Zoom. So one of the things I think is really important is that you have to check in more as a leader with someone who's grieving if you have hybrid or remote work environment okay. because they may not volunteer it. You may have to you may have to ask and you don't have those casual encounters in the hallway or those team meetings where you can pick it up yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's um, more and important. on that, um, I'm going to take that conversation. I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit um, or expand that mm-hmm. because we look at today's society. Um, we're all yeah, we're working remote. We're online more. Um, and our, especially our younger people are more communicating digitally versus face-to-face. And right. I think COVID created 
that you've got the metaverse coming where people are uh, creating their own little uh, images of themselves right. and, like we are becoming less touchy feely uh, i think in some ways right we we don't you know we quit hugging for like two years um so as the society it, it doesn't look like maybe we'll have a pendulum swing back now that covid seems to be uh less uh you know of the big fear of everybody um but still i think society's moving in this direction that says in some ways we're more impersonal and we're 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 even watching concerts uh online and stuff so it's like so the question is young people and younger employees and just younger mm -hmm. people in general having to deal with their grief and their friends grief in a in a society that's um maybe a little less uh touchy feely in some right. ways. Exactly. Well, and again, I think it's it's just about making that extra effort, right? That if it's if it's safe and appropriate, which of course it is right now, getting together one-on-one -on -one in person with an, an employee who's struggling. And and if you can't do that, then at least Zoom one-on-one -on -one where you can just have that conversation and just say, you know, how are things going for you? You know, what does support look like for you? What can I do for you this week? today that would be helpful to you and giving that person both the opportunity to say what they need, but also just conveying the message that I want to know how I can help you. And so even if that person doesn't need anything or have an answer in that moment, the, the message, you know, sending that message saying that I will, I will do things to help you. Right. Th I think that's really important. Okay. Um, any closing thoughts, anything else? we need to talk about? So I think the most important thing is really just to show up for your people, right? That that matters more than anything else. It means, you know, letting them know that you are, that you want to acknowledge their loss and that you are here to support them and, and showing up. I think that's most important of all. Show up for your people. Show Margo, up for your people. thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for writing this book, uh, Leading Through Loss. Uh, where can you, you can buy it, I assume. Amazon, Amazon. Barnes yeah. & Noble, independent bookstores. Yeah. Exactly. So it's out there. You can get it. It's a, it's a quick read. It's a smaller book. But uh, um, again, thanks for sharing your story. And thanks for being here with us today on The Mark Haney Show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Mark. You bet. Welcome back to the Mark Haney Show and only a second left. Margo and I had a great conversation today about leading through loss and it's a difficult thing. And so all, building a business is difficult. So all you out there that are working to build a business and to everybody out there that has had a loss, um, you know, here at Haney Biz, uh, the Growth Factory and the Mark Haney Show, you know, we, we stand beside you. We're always above you. Oh, excuse me. We're never above you. We're never below you. We're always by your side. Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the, in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.